Good evening. If you would now, uh, our scripture text this evening is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Philippians chapter 2. Listen, for this is God's holy word. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading and preaching of his word. I've said it before, but as long as there are people in the church, there will be problems. Common evidence of those problems often results in denominational or even church splits. There are occasions where these splits are absolutely and biblically necessary, but oftentimes the splits come over non-essential opinions or even fringe movements that sweep through the church. Oftentimes it is over a practical disagreement about what should be the emphasis of this particular church and her practice. And this is why today you have a marketplace of churches out there, each with its own distinctive, each with its own selling points as to what makes this particular church better than others. And all along the way, it causes actually more division even within the church than it does unity. Not only that, but the most important truths regarding the gospel becomes foggy and unidentifiable to outsiders and even insiders. And if you talk to many who have gone through a church split at some point or another, what was involved was selfish ambition and conceit. We care more about making a statement than about God and his people. As we approach this text, we have found that Paul has been encouraging this Philippian church within the context of opposition and conflict. He has addressed their inner conflict and their outer conflict as they face opponents. And in order to withstand the opposition to the gospel from within and from without, he calls them to serve one another in unity all for the sake of the one gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is so they can endure persecution, which is inevitable in every church, even down to our day. Now today it takes more on the form of an ism within the church or a troubling of souls, specifically here in the U.S. But we are, to remi we are reminded about who we are united to first in that we are also united to one another, whether we like it or not. He calls us to serve one another. So the question for this text is, what does it take to do this? Well, according to Paul, it takes one common and humble mind. And that's the one point I have for you this evening. Have one mind. Paul begins by laying down some qualities given to the people of God. He lists four ifs. Here he is not at all saying that it's okay if you're lacking one of these ifs, if there is. Here we can sum it up what he says by saying, if there are any believers. These qualities are essential for the church. 
in order to bring about a certain end or goal in the life of the church. These are identity markers for the church of Jesus Christ. But what is important to note, that none of these qualities is of our own making. We can say it's not produced by human efforts or four steps to become a unified church. Rather, it is all of grace, and it is all from Jesus Christ himself. And considering that Paul wrote the letter as an encouragement, there's always room for growth in these areas. This is why he says first, if there is any encouragement in Christ, as there is no greater encouragement than to be in Christ and to receive encouragement from Christ through specific means. We know as we gather each Lord's Day, there are specific means. The word of God preached, partaking of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and fellowship with one another. These are all means to encourage us and build us up in Christ. And Paul has been encouraging this Philippian church throughout this letter that Christ will complete them totally one day. And that their identity is to be found in Christ. So the greatest encouragement in the world and the only true encouragement that there is to be found in the world is to be in Christ. Secondly, if there is any comfort from love. And this love is also the love of Christ from Christ. It is the love that we share toward one another in Christ. For if there is no love, there is no true fellowship. There is no true communion with one another. Neither with God nor with each other. We can hang out every week, but If there's no love, there is no fellowship. There is no communion. And so he continues, thirdly, if there is any participation or fellowship in the Spirit. This is the third time in his letter that he mentions fellowship. We have a fellowship in the gospel, a fellowship of grace. And here now he says, we have a fellowship in the Holy Spirit. We have a common bond and communion with one another as we commune with the triune God through the torn flesh of Christ by his spirit. We are tethered to one another whether we like it or not. But how often do we say to ourselves, please, Lord, not him. Please, Lord, he talks too much. He smells a little funky. She has too many problems for anyone to bear. There's no evident halo around his head. Then we judge based on superficialities. As we mentioned last week in the morning sermon on James, we judge and we cast others aside without knowing them at all. That person always looks troubled, but we're never concerned to ask. Fourthly, If there is any affection and sympathy, this is speaking of the compassion coming from the affection of Christ. This affection and sympathy were first shown to us by Christ. And it is expected that Christian ought to have this affection and sympathy toward others. But how often do we grow so cold in these qualities? How often do we disregard others? We disregard disregard their struggles and pains and lack in true affection and sympathy toward one another. It could be an indication that we have not only grown cold toward one another, but we have also grown cold toward God because the two are never disconnected. And Paul doesn't list these qualifications so we can check off four boxes and feel good about ourselves. But there is an outward focus here. These qualities do not just linger somewhere in the imaginations of our minds, but they bring about a certain end. Here he says, complete my joy. Again, he comes full circle in reference to his joy. He began this letter with a prayer of joy. He rejoiced 
in the proclamation of the gospel. He rejoices in his own salvation. And now he says, complete that joy. This is the joy of an under-shepherd watching the sheep collectively in single file. Not one missing, walking into the sheep's den through one door, Jesus Christ. And that picture helps us to answer how we are to complete his joy or what would complete his joy. Not only his joy, but the joy of the divine author of this letter, God himself. And that is unity. A unity of mind. The word used for mind is repeated three times. He says, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, the word for accord is mind, and of one mind. This play on words is to emphasize that they are to have the same understanding of what the church is all about. And if you remember earlier in the letter, he called them to grow in the love and it is to be accompanied with knowledge and all discernment. Love always engages our minds. It's not just mere emotions. And it involves a common understanding. In any church that names the name of Christ, there ought to be the sameness in our understanding and direction. Remember the life of worthy of the gospel is one that, that is lived side by side, standing firm in the faith of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't just stand in thin air, in other words. Does this mean that the church, as we are a collective group of individuals, are to agree on everything out there in the world? Are we to agree on what cars to drive? What music to listen to? What politicians to support? What schools to put our kids in? What clothes to wear? No, not at all. That's not what it means to be of the same mind here. Rather, it means we are to have the mind of Christ. And the things that Christ was concerned with. Christ prayed to the Father that we are to be one as we have one shepherd so we hear one voice and we are to be one flock. And this mind of Christ is a mind of servitude. As Christ lived for and laid his life down for others, specifically for sinners. And this is how the united mind of Christ, it's not a denomination, the united mind of Christ is expressed. This is how we know that we have a common understanding. I always want to stress that we are to have common doctrine and that doctrine is important. What we believe is important and essential. That's why we have confessions and catechisms. But to have one Humble mind is not just about intellectual ability to recite doctrine. The mind of Christ to Paul is expressed here as serving one another. Because we don't only share the same mind, but we also share the same love as well. So he continues, do nothing, in my translation says, from selfish ambition and conceit. This is speaking of a high and lofty opinion of oneself. There were some in this church that preached out of wrong motives in order to harm Paul. And Paul still commended the preaching of that gospel. But now he gets down to heart work. He now addresses our motives in the church and why we do what we do. He is saying, do not live like the rest of the world. In disunity. The world operates out of selfish ambition and conceit with high and lofty opinions of self. Rather, have a lowly opinion of self, a lowly opinion of one's own abilities, a lowly opinion of one's own mind and understanding 
for the sake of the mind of Christ and acknowledge our own moral littleness. He says somewhere else, never be wise in your own sight. Rather, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. And with all that's going on in the world, being wise in our own sight could be a trap for many of us. And he clarifies what it means to count others more significant than ourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is speaking of the ultimate good of others. And in this case, self must be put aside. And all of this according to God's will, of course. This is not speaking of sinful interests or illegal interests. You're not looking to someone's uh, drug campaign and saying, well, I want to support him in these interests. No, that's not what he's speaking of. This is not speaking of whatever makes someone happy. We see this even essential for our own families. Parents who are only looking out for their own interests can destroy their families. And parents who only look to their family's interests and in making them happy, specifically children, will be creating monsters in society. The same goes for the church. Paul demonstrated that his ministry was for others. It wasn't for himself. He was seeking the spiritual nourishment of others. When he preached, he wasn't preaching for his sake. He wasn't preaching for his own popularity. But preaching was a supreme act of love for others, for the body of Christ. Because that is what they needed most. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ prescribed as well. But how much of our lives is driven by selfish ambition and conceit. This selfish ambition breeds disunity. This selfish ambition will harm the church. It will destroy the church. It only leads to destruction. So first, we must consider what we are called into. We must consider who it is we are united to, to understand the gravity and the importance of un unity. Because what brings us together is that we are in Christ. We are in one body. And Christ didn't come to be served. He came to serve and he served his people. Christ died for his body in order to redeem his church from their sins. And so there is one body and one spirit one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. It is from what Christ has done that we are devoted to his body. And after we consider our communion and the bond of fellowship that we have in Christ, we should ask, how well do we, do, do we respond to disagreements in the body? Do our own opinions matter more than those of others? We are raised in a society that is all about taking care of number one first. I am the most important person in the world. And we are taught to become gods of our own lives in complete control. But Paul is saying, forget yourself. With all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. <clears throat> and this is not just for our sake. This is not just so we can be happy and not bothered by the controversies of the day, but this is so that Christ is honored. This is so that Christ would be put forth in our lives and in his church. What we do as a church has <clears throat> eternal significance in recognition that everything around us is temporal, including the kingdoms of this world 
the things we possess will all soon pass? Would we trade the temporal for the eternal? Then we should ask ourselves, do we have the same mind? That is, the mind of Christ. We, we see in Paul, in Romans 14 and 15, he speaks about bearing with one another. And he grounds it in the example of Christ. And bearing with the weak, not to please ourselves. If someone, for instance, wants to celebrate a Christian feast day, and he wants to abstain from certain foods, Paul says, let him. Who are we to say no? But also, vice versa, it shouldn't be imposed on us either. Why? Because we are called to love whom Christ loved. And Christ loved his church. And his church is pretty messed up. We are. We're a messed up group of individuals. And we just need to look in the mirror once or twice a day. Don't do it too much. <clears throat> but how often do our opinions become priority? Selfish interests appearing as making spiritual proclamation in an erudite or learned manner. How often our own self-interest is confused with another's good. We even think we'll write a book about it. We'll know if it is self-interest or not. If we pout about it afterwards when we don't get our way. How often do we manipulate situations and people to fulfill our own selfish ambition and conceit. But this, as Paul says, is not what we have in Christ. This is not what we have in the one whom died and rose for us, who laid it all for our sins. Instead, we are called to set aside our selfish ambition and conceitedness so that we would count others more significant than ourselves. This is equated with what it means to live a Christ-centered life. Can we restrain our own desires in order to satisfy someone else's? Are we united with the same mind and the same mission for the gospel of Christ? Or are we just in it to win it? Are we in it just to feel important? When we read through Paul's letter to the Philippians, everything to Paul was about knowing Christ. It was not about what other people thought about him. It was about knowing Jesus Christ. Yet it was never detached from walking side by side with one another in love and unity. I'll end with scripture. When Paul calls the Colossians to put on the new self, which is Christ, after he tells them to put to death what is earthly in them, he describes putting on Christ and he gives us a blueprint to having this united mind. He says this, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, shout it from the mountaintops. No. Forgiving each other. And he grounds it in the gospel. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body. And he ends by saying, and be thankful. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for, again, another wonderful Lord's Day as we
share it together in the peace and the harmony that comes from your spirit. We pray that you continue to pour out your love into our hearts. Humble us before your cross as we rely on Christ for all things that we may one day come before your throne as those covered by his righteousness and filled with his spirit as his spirit seals all things to us and give us all we need to live this Christian life. In Jesus' name, amen.